Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rob Barrett, I'm from Queen's University in Belfast and today I'm going to be talking about uh, game engines, uh, but more about 3D reconstructions and a lot about the <coughs> theoretical background to 3D reconstructions and simulations in archaeology and I'll be giving you some examples at the end of when I implemented some custom scripts in the Maltese landscape to get more information and uh, further our interpretation of the archaeological context. So, oh, no, that's not the right button. There. Um, so when we talk about 3D reconstruction in archaeology, this is often what we have in mind. Um, 3D reconstruction is mainly used for presentation, uh, especially to the general public. So you get a lot of this, a lot of nice renders, a lot of pretty pictures um, of you know, very interesting sites. And this is a great tool uh, for uh, transmitting our knowledge, our uh, understanding of archaeological evidence, especially to the public. Uh, but I think we can do a lot more uh, with 3D reconstructions. I think through the use of simulations and gaming engines, we can actually um, advance our interpretation of archaeological sites. Um, and that's because um, 3D reconstructions <coughs> are a great system for experimentation. They possess physics, they have some kind of um, physicality in a way, and that means that they can be act as a system with variables that you can uh, change and adapt in order to um, get some conclusions, get some new raw data that can be used to uh, better understand the archaeological context. And these, um, and this new data, this new conclusions have uh, actual applications in the real archaeological evidence. Um, so when I talk about 3D reconstruction, gaming engines, what I'm actually thinking about is more this kind of image, which is not as pretty, it's not as nice, but this is actually creating new data that can be used to interpret archaeological sites. Um, and the use of custom scripts, pieces of software written specifically to answer specific questions, um, can help us answer these research questions um, with, with more data. And we'll be looking at these two examples uh, in a bit later. Um, but before anything else, I want to go a bit more to the theoretical background to 3D reconstructions and simulations, uh, because it's drawn a lot of criticism, uh, both by 3D modelers and archaeologists in general, um, due to accuracy um, and inaccuracies. Um, when you see a 3D model like this, it's very difficult to determine which of these elements is hypothetical and which one is based on actual archaeological evidence. Um, and this is obviously can have a lot of problems because, first of all, it's subjective. Uh, it's, some people think it's unreliable. Um, and that's because you can't really trace back and know exactly what's going on. But I would I'd like to think that this is a problem not just of 3D reconstruction simulations, it's also a problem that is a wider archaeological problem. Um, and that's because of hyper-realities. And the hyper-realities is this uh, very big term, but actually it's quite simple. It was introduced by Baudrillard, and um, it's basically the idea that there are um, some realities which are a mixture of hypotheses and uh, or, or fiction and, and reality and these two are mixed so well between one another that it's difficult uh, to determine which is which. So if you think about reality TV, it's very difficult to see. Yeah, it's a silly example but it, it proves the point. You know, reality TV, you look at it and you go, well, that could be genuine acting, or sorry, the genuine emotion, that could be acting, that just could be editing. So the fiction and realism is so intermingled that it's very difficult to determine mm -hmm. Uh, what is what. And this is a big problem of 3D reconstruction, as you can imagine, because the hypothetical and the archaeological evidence are mixed together and they are indistinguishable. Now, when we talk about archaeology, this is kind of a system of, of um, archaeological thought that brings from the archaeological evidence to the archaeological interpretation. So I'll go through this very quickly. Um, what we're trying to do as archaeologists is we're trying to access what we call an original reality. This is a culture, past culture, which to us is, is lost. You know, the Roman culture, the medieval culture. And that original reality is in itself a hyper-reality because you've got the archaeological evidence, which is intermingled with our own culture, our own understanding, our own ideas. Uh, and they're so mixed together that it's difficult to determine. Um, we also have the past reality, which is the archaeological uh, evidence, so archaeological finds. Um, and through this, we can access that original reality. We have some limiting constraints that give us a better understanding of the past culture. Uh, the archaeological records are a copy of those archaeological evidence, and then we use those archaeological records to provide constraints to archaeological interpretation. But the archaeological interpretation is itself a hyper-reality, 
because our hypotheses and the archaeological evidence are often so intermingled that just by reading, you know, any book, archaeological book, it's very difficult to determine uh, what is hypothesis and what is real. And this system is very similar to what we use in freedom of reconstruction and simulation. Uh, you've got the originality, the partial reality again, um, and then you've got the base model, which is just the 3D reconstruction you do based on the archaeological evidence, which is itself a copy of the archaeological evidence, and then the base model provides constraints to the hypothetical model, which is when you add all the elements to embellish it and to uh, complete it. So what I'm saying is the similarities between the two methods. While there's hyper-realities in 3D reconstructions, and these could be problematic, we got the same problems in archaeological interpretation as a whole. Um, um, but obviously, um, there are ways to help um, justify these, uh, this unreliability, and that's through the use of metadata and paradata. If you keep a good record of how you go from that stage to that stage, from that stage to that stage, that stage to that stage, then you can trace it back and you can see how you can go from the hypothetical model all the way back. And that gives you um, a reliable reliable information on the overall accuracy of the data you are presenting. And that's the, the, the basics of, uh, of uh, the sensitive method. Um, so, so in conclusion, um, well not conclusion, I think, <laughs> theoretical conclusion, um, is that uh, although subjectivity and inaccuracies are inevitable uh, in free reconstruction and archaeology in general, this doesn't mean that we, we can't trust it as a whole uh, if we use metadata and paradata uh, carefully enough. Then it's much. Then you can trace it back, and you can, um, and then you, and it's it's uh, you can replicate it. You can uh, analyze uh, how how good it is, and that's very important. Um, now, um, going back to custom scripts, um, this is what I mean by custom scripts. It's just a little piece of code written to answer a specific question, um, and. Um, I work with well, game engines, I work with Unity 3D, and that's because um, you can import a 3D model into it, you write a piece of code, and you can export data through that piece of code. Uh, and this is very important because uh, you're generating more data, but also if you've got a very specific question that you're trying to ask and you're trying to answer, um, stuff like this can help you answer uh, those specific questions. Um, so going on to a few examples, I work a lot in Malta. Um, Specifically, Neolithic Malta. Uh, so Malta is is these two islands. Uh, I'm sure you're aware, but um, Malta was very uh, very famous in the Neolithic uh, because they built enormous megalithic structures between 3600 and 700 BC. <coughs> some of them pointed out, um, and these enormous structures are imagine Stonehenge but much bigger and nicer essentially. They're great, um, but um, they're, they're very important because we have a lot of of um, material evidence, but not a lot is known about the culture, what these people. Um, although we have a good understanding of, uh, of some of their beliefs, for example, we know that uh, they were very strong on the binary between life and death and light and dark. These were very strong concepts. And they used uh, like screens and they used uh, certain uh, tricks to sort of uh, funnel light in certain directions and visibility in certain directions. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, interesting concepts that we can try and uh, analyze on different sites. Um, so this site here is the uh, site of Gigantia. It's a temple site. Um, I mean, it's a free reconstruction of it, obviously, but we've got two temples, one next to the other. Um, and this is kind of what we've got today. That, that's pretty much what's remaining. Um, so one of the things I wanted to look at Gigantia is solar alignment, because solar alignment is very important in Malta. Most of the temples seem to be aligned with winter or, or summer solstice. Um, so I wanted to check if it was true that Chikantia was aligned with the winter solstice. But rather than just check the one date to see if there was an alignment, I wanted to check throughout the entire year to see where this alignment happened and, and how that affected the use of the temple. Um, so I wrote a, a piece of code that um, calculated solar alignment for every minute of the year. And it does this in about 20 seconds. Um, and what I got is this little graph here. So I'm exporting actual new data, actual raw data, uh, that can then be modified and you can get graphs and stuff out of it. Um, so one of the things you may notice is that if you look at the 21st of December, the, the winter solstice, that's when uh, it has peak alignment with the temple, with both temples, in fact. Uh, but the thing that really uh, uh, stood out to me is that 
it's not only on that day that you've got the alignment, it's actually the entire week is a peak alignment, and a, a full month and a half before and a full month and a half later, there's still alignment at that temple. So rather than being one singular event, one singular important day, it's in fact feasible, it was much more drawn out, and you know, you could have an entire week or entire months of, of solar alignment with associated events. Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, okay, so this is, a, this is another site. This is uh, the uh, Zagreb Rockwell Circle. It's seen from on top. Really, it's a bit of a weird angle. It's a 3D model. Um, so this is uh, Hypogea. It's, a, it's an underground cave system which was used uh, for the burial of the dead. Uh, they would take the bodies down here and then separate them into different chambers. But uh, one of the important things about, I think, about uh, the Zagreb Rockwell Circle is the use of screens. So this stuff here, um, those are actual megalithic screens, they're big pieces of rock which are placed. And the idea is that they're placed there to funnel your view into certain areas, to limit your view in certain other areas, and maybe to also impact lighting. Um, so I was, interested to see, I was interested to see in this how uh, screens affected the overall visibility of the site. So I wrote another piece of code which produces that we saw earlier. Um, so this is just a visibility map of the site, but it shows it from human eye looking downwards. Um, and in this one here, this is without a megalith. There's a megalith here, which is missing in the site, but is, is suggested that it's there. Um, and in this one, you can see there's quite high visibility. Um, interesting enough, there's a big visibility corridor in the middle, and that's similar to what we have in temples, so it's showing parallels between the two. And also, there's an area which was called a display area in the original excavation, and that's that one there, which is highly visible. So it's sort of confirming that that is a high visibility area. And then by changing very small variables, by adding that one screen here, you can see that, I mean, I'm not sure it comes across because of the lighting, but this area is much darker, so that area is much less visible by the addition of that one small screen there. So by manipulating space, by adding screens, megalithic screens, you can drastically change the visibility of a site. And again, this is a custom script which is creating new data which helps us understand better uh, this archaeological site. Whoops, I'm going to try it um, Obviously, there are limitations uh, to this. Uh, even with power data, metadata, if you don't have enough information to reconstruct the models or um, you, know, you don't have enough archaeological evidence, then obviously it's difficult to um, uh, the data you, you're going to obtain, the information you're going to obtain is going to be, the reliability is based on that uh, archaeological evidence, so the more you have, the better, the less, obviously the less accurate it is. Um, but also I think it's very important to have a specific question to ask the software. Um, a lot of people do 3D construction just for the purpose of doing a 3D model uh, to make a nice thing, uh, but I think if you actually write a custom script, you should be doing it to answer a specific question you have in mind. Uh, and that's something that's not always, that's not always come across. But um, in conclusion, I think that like, 3D construction and simulation um, are basically uh, congruous with archaeological practice. They have very sim uh, vast similarities. I only managed to talk a bit about it, but there's a lot more uh, going on as well. Um, custom, tips, custom tools can be used to uh, answer a specific archaeological question, and they can uh, create data that has uh, implications on the wider archaeological uh, evidence and interpretation. Uh, yeah, that's it. Um, this is more than people, fun day, which fun. Also, I've got a, a blog that you can follow. Yeah, cool. Cheers. Cheers.